Good morning. Our brothers and I welcome you this day to the house of our Lord and thankful that he has prepared this for us, that we can come. We can come before his table this day and that we might uh, have his presence to be with us. I do have just a couple of quick announcements this morning to uh, bring to our attention. If you have not heard, uh, our brother or our sister, uh, Phyllis McCarty, passed away yesterday afternoon. And once the uh, arrangements are have been uh, made, then we'll pass that along to you. But if you would remember uh, all of uh, Phyllis's family, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, just uh, as a reminder that the ladies' uh, activity that was for next Sunday or next Saturday has been postponed to a later date, and they'll get that with you that uh, that English tea that they were going to have. So that'll be postponed for a later date. For a call to worship, uh, I would read from the first chapter of First uh, John chapter 4. These are several passages of scripture. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time except them who believe. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. Whoso shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, dwelleth in him, and he in God. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And it is out of that love that he has for us that we are here this day. It is out of that love that he sacrificed upon the cross that we might live. And we come this day to partake of the sacrament that he has prepared for us, that through this we might live and that we might have life and that we might rejoice and look forward to his coming once again. So might you bless us this day. Might we be mindful of his love and his goodness and might we express that love not only here but in all that we do. And may he bless us this day as we come to worship him.
our Heavenly Father. Lord, how um, richly blessed that we are with the promise of the everlasting kingdom. Thy kingdom, Heavenly Father. And the love that thou hast for us, as was mentioned this morning, and has talked here greatly. So I would ask that thy spirit would continue to be here this morning with us, that as we would proceed, we might be touched, each and every one of us, by thy spirit. That we would fill your calling, Heavenly Father, to that which you have called us to. That indeed we might serve and love one another, and in so doing, serve you. And that that love would grow outward into the community and even into the world for that which is to come, that all might see and understand and know. And so it is we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. To the best of our ability, let us kneel facing the altar. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son and witness unto Thee. God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments, which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen.
Let's kneel before the altar. Prayer of wine is ready. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, and that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen.
I read earlier in the call to worship from 1 John chapter 4. And it says, if we love him, we love him because he first loved us. And if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And this week, as I uh, was in preparation for today's service, I couldn't help but think of this love that he has for us. And in turn, uh, we express that love uh, to him. We express that love unto others by the opportunities that are before us each and every day. And I got to thinking about uh, even our service today. You know, we come and we partake of the sacraments, those emblems that represent uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But somebody had to make the bread for us today. And each and every month there were those in the congregation that uh, give of their time and their talents to make that bread. And it's made out of love. Our sister Terry did that for us this sacrament Sunday. Thought about the wine that represents the, the blood of our Lord and Savior and the love that goes into making that sacramental wine. Of those who on a early July hot morning would uh, gather at the vineyard and pick the grapes and gather back here in the uh, fellowship hall and uh, stem those grapes and make the juice for our sacramental wine. It's done out of a love, out of love and obedience to our Heavenly Father to be compliant with His Word. Those opportunities that are before us to even come and to share together. As Mariah would uh, plan out each and every month our pianist for us, for Amy, for today. It's for the special music that we have in our services that Courtney, out of love, lines up for us each and every month. It's the love that Sharon and those helpers that she has up there with her each and every Sunday come and make sure that our sound is there for us to hear. And we can broadcast our services over the internet on YouTube, which I was able to watch last Sunday after we got back from being out of town. What a blessing. And those are done out of love. It's done out of love that our priesthood go into the homes after this service and take the sacrament to those who cannot be here or into the hospital, to those who uh, desire. It's out of a love that we have a sanctuary in this facility that Heavenly Father has provided us with. It's out of a love that our sister Annie comes week after week It gives up her time freely that we can have a sanctuary clean to worship in. It's out of love that we have decorations in our sanctuary and that Sharon and Carmen come and they give of their time out of love because she first loved us. It's out of love that our house is in order for people like Jim and Bev come and give her their time to organize our, our closets and keep things night and tea nice and tidy for us. It's out of love that Kurt comes and keeps our lawnmowers running for us because Rex and I are pretty rough on them sometimes. But he keeps them going that we can keep our grounds uh, in shape and looking nice. It's out of love that you and this congregation have opportunity to express that love to those who stand in need. It's out of love that we give to the oblation fund to help others. It's out of love that you give of your time to provide meals for those who have uh, had surgeries or recuperating or those who are ill the time that Myra lines up those meals for those individuals and you respond and say, yes, here am I, O oh Lord. It's out of love that you give because he first loved you. It's out of love that you give of your time for those funeral and memorial dinners. Love. 
It's out of love that our youth leaders gather together with the youth as we did yesterday afternoon. As Jeremy and Donna came and spent time with the youth and for Jenny who came and taught the painting class. It's out of love that they give of their time to spend with our youth, our church school teachers, all of them. Our vacation church school that's coming up. Rachel, give up her time to be the director. Those in the past, such as Sandy and Courtney and many others, give up their time because he loves. It's our women's group and all the activities that they have. It's because they have a desire to love one another. It's our priesthood we've been blessed with who have that desire to love because he loves us. That they go. They go on administrations all hours of the day and night. They go into the homes and visit with the saints. They go to the hospitals and share. He first loved us. And that's part of our stewardship is to extend that love unto others. And that is a part of our covenant relationship as we follow our Heavenly Father, is we give. And we give because He gives unto us of His love. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for uh, the goodness that You've uh, blessed us with. Father, we thank You for the love that You have as even to, as uh, shared this day, Father, through the emblems that we have partaken of of your broken body and spilt blood. Might we recognize, Father, that uh, you died for us. And that is the greatest love that anyone can have is that a man would lay down his life for his friend. And Father, you laid down your life for us. And part of our response, Father, is to extend that love unto others. And I'm thankful to be a part of a congregation that loves, that gives of their time, Father, that sacrifices of themselves to help meet the needs of others. And Father, that's what a congregation is. It's brothers and sisters in Christ coming together as one to serve and to love. And so I would pray this day, Father, and we're thankful for the love of this body. And I pray, Father, that we might understand that our stewardship is more than just finances, and giving to help support the church, to support this congregation. It's about being of service, Father. And so I pray that you would bless us. And as we do give this day, might you bless those funds and those finances, Father, for your wise purposes, and that we might go forward this day with a deeper desire to serve you and to serve one another. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. It is good to be here today. It's uh, good to see faces we don't get to see all the time. I know there's at least uh, two sets of parents that are happy to have children here that don't live here anymore. Me too. Um, I should have just let Ken continue because um, my theme today is God's love. You're on a roll, Ken. I didn't mean to interrupt. So, first and foremost, I want to assure you that God loves you. There are no gaps in his love. There is no hesitation. He loves you. That's my theme for today, but that's God's theme every day, and God never changes. God does not change, but I know times change and customs change and social things change. Without any research or looking, just going with my gut feeling, I'm going to speculate that sharing a meal with somebody is a custom that goes back a long way. And that, that really doesn't change. Trying to gather the family together at the end of the day and talk about how your days have gone, or meeting with friends either in your home or their home, or maybe going out together to a restaurant, that's something that tends to be um, a little intimate, maybe. Something you do with those closest to you. So we used to have a couple in our neighborhood that were kind of our social directors. And they were always gathering us together for one purpose or another. And we never, um, nobody else ever seemed to take the reins on that. And when they moved, those meetings stopped. And we're not as close with those neighbors now as we used to be. I guess we could have stepped up, but we didn't. And so it was with Jesus and his disciples, those closest to him. He gathered them together for a meal just before his crucifixion. We now call that the Last Supper. His last chance to talk with them before the crucifixion to prepare them as best he could for what was to come. And so it's no small thing that you've been invited here today in our recreation of that Last Supper meal to partake in the sacred ordinance, to eat of the bread and the wine that represent his body and his spilt blood, to recognize that he has paid the price for our redemption. Jesus invites us here this day Ken didn't invite you, and I don't invite you. Jesus invites you here this day. Because you are close to him, and he is close to you. If you look at John 3, 16 and 17, and you all probably get tired of hearing me quote this, but I consider that to be a foundational scripture for Christianity. It answers the questions, why did God send Jesus to us? And why did he allow him to be crucified as intercession for our sins? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Ken just said it. You know, not only did Jesus lay, lay down his life at the crucifixion for our sins, but he laid down his life every day to teach us and to lead us. Laying down your life doesn't have to end in death immediately. Laying down your life can be in service. But Jesus came not only to be crucified, but to teach us the way to be with him for eternity. He spent all his time diligently preaching and teaching, Sometimes he taught by walking people through the thought process to find the right answer, 
and sometimes by telling stories that we call parables. I guess you could call those the original Christian fiction. Not true stories, but they illustrate a point. If you think about the prodigal son in that parable, the son requested his inheritance from his father long before his father's death. I always think of an inheritance as something you get when somebody dies, and a gift is something you get from somebody while they're still alive. But evidently, customs were a little different, or maybe I'm just wrong on my interpretation, but he got his inheritance early. The father bestowed half of all his goods upon his son. In my mind, I imagine the father had misgivings. I'm assuming the son was pretty young. Let's say he was 18, 19 years old. And I'm sure that his father worried that his son did not have the experience or the knowledge to handle such a large sum of money without his parents' guidance. But the father acquiesced, and you know the story. The son traveled to a far country, and he wasted his substance on riotous living. The scriptures don't tell us what riotous living is. It leaves it to your imagination. But we're in church, so don't let your imagination run too wild. He ended up living and sharing food with swine, and no man would help him. And finally, he decides to return home to his father's house, because he knows that even the servants there are treated far better than he is being treated now. When the sun was sorry, when the sun was still a far way off. His father saw him. And he did not sit and wait for his son. He ran to him, to meet him, to welcome him back with open arms and full forgiveness. I don't suppose it was a coincidence that his father was looking down the road as he came. His father was looking down the road every day, waiting. It didn't take a great deal of insight on my part to figure out that the father represents God. And the son got his inheritance from God, just like we get our agency. We can waste it, or we can be good and faithful servants. Father never stopped looking down the road. God never stops looking for us. It doesn't matter how far off the path we travel or how riotous or egregious our life is. God wants us back, always. He wants to welcome us back with love and full forgiveness. All we have to do is come to the same realization that the prodigal son came to. All we have to do is turn away from that which separates us from God and reach out. God loves us collectively and individually. I think it's probably a pretty good idea to listen to what Jesus has to say on any subject on life. I'm pretty sure I got that idea from the scriptures. Both the 24th chapter of Matthew and Mark 13 quote Jesus as saying, Whoso treasureth up my words shall not be deceived. There's a lot of deception out there. And from 2 Nephi, with Nephi speaking, he admonishes, Feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things which he should do. And to what end do we feast on the words of Christ? Probably dozens of answers to that question. But one answer would be to try to discover the depth and the breadth of God's love for us. 
because that is evident throughout the scriptures. Another would be to learn what we're supposed to be doing here and now while we're on this earth. For instruction, I love the Sermon on the Mount. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read a portion of that, starting from the beginning. And Jesus opened his mouth and taught the disciples, saying, Blessed are they who shall believe on me, and again, more blessed are they who shall believe on your words, when you shall testify that you have seen me, and that I am. Yea, blessed are they who shall believe your believe on your words and come down into the depth of humility and be baptized in my name for they shall be visited with fire in the Holy Ghost and shall receive a remission of their sins yea blessed are the poor in spirit who come unto me for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and again blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted and blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth and blessed are all they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are all the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are all the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are all they that are persecuted for my name's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For ye shall have great joy and be exceeding glad. For great shall be your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, I was looking through those verses and I couldn't find where it said, Blessed are they who argue most vigorous, vigorously and vehemently. Couldn't find where it said, Blessed are the pushiest and the bullies. Or it said, Blessed are they who crush their enemies in winning an argument. And evidently, no points are given for shouting the loudest or getting the angriest. You know, like those who gathered around the woman who was taken in adultery, we all have piles of rocks that we can throw. We all have words that we could use that hurt. But we need to be careful about establishing a precedent where we throw the rocks. Because sometimes those rocks tend to come back at us. So how should we deal with one another as believers of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and those who don't share our beliefs? Well, I'm going back to the Sermon on the Mount, still in the fifth chapter of Matthew. You have heard it said... An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have it. And if he sue thee again, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him a mile. And whosoever shall compel thee to go with him twain, thou shalt go with him twain. Give to him that asketh of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. Ye have heard it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you only love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans the same? We're not supposed to be like everybody else. Our standard is not the world. Our standard is Jesus Christ. Well, so perhaps you try to do all these things, but you still have struggles. Anybody here have struggles? 
a little bit? Okay. Years ago, I had a Baptist friend at work, and he and I used to discuss religion all the time. And um, we weren't really trying to convert each other, and to his credit, he was curious. First, I had to make him understand that we weren't the people from Salt Lake. It took him a while. And then we got to discussing doctrine. We came to a lot of agreement. Um, but one day we were in a non-religious discussion in a group, and I don't know how it went, but somebody said, well, life's just not fair. And his comment was, even for a Christian. And I smiled at him and I said, especially for a Christian. Only one perfect Christian ever, just one. We crucified him. That was hardly fair. His closest followers spent time in jail, none of which died of of natural causes. They dedicated their lives to serving him, but it didn't guarantee an easy life. We were uh, discussing that in the Book of Mormon class downstairs, and the comment was made, yeah, the scriptures are full of stories about people who had life easy. Sarcasm. Okay, sarcasm, right? Everybody with me? So, I invite you to come to prayer meeting. And you may find there that maybe your struggles aren't as bad as you think. We've got emergency surgeries, accidents, injuries, illnesses. Some of those illnesses are long-term. Financial difficulties. Families with internal struggles, loss of loved ones. The prayer list is long. We all have struggles. But I would say to you from the scriptures, Second Timothy, fear not. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that sound mind and a clear reading should tell you that God's word is not a promise of a struggle-free life, but it is a guidebook showing us how to make our way through those struggles, through the strife and the stress. John 14 says, let not your heart be troubled. And I would encourage you, let not your heart be troubled. God is in, on his throne and he is in charge. You believe in God, believe also in Jesus. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will prepare a place for you and come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. The prodigal son made poor choices. So do I. The prodigal son yielded to the siren song of the world's temptations. Sometimes, so do I. But the prodigal son's father welcomed him back and rejoiced upon his return. And so does our Heavenly Father when we return to Him. Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus overcomes all. Remember that God loves you so much that He invited you to this feast today in his honor, and his love for you never changes.
our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, it is indeed with praise in our hearts that we would approach your throne at this time. Father, we praise your name for we know that your good spirit has been with us. We praise your name for allowing us to renew our covenant that we made to you in the waters of baptism. And Father, as we leave your house this day, we would ask that the words that your servant has brought to us this day might indeed be in our hearts and our minds. We would ask, Father, that you would grant us the strength and the wisdom in our service to you and to our fellow man It might indeed be so pleasing in your sight. I would ask these things, Father, in your Son's most kind and gracious name. In Jesus' name.